Hello everybody, my name is Tyler Dryblatt. I'm the Interpretive Programs Manager here at Fort Miles. And today we are gonna be discussing the crown jewel of the Fort Miles Museum, our 12-inch gun. The 12-inch gun is something you really only get to see if you come on one of our tours, but with so many people stuck at home, we thought we'd bring it to you today. Unfortunately, this is not the original gun that was here during the 1940s. When the army withdrew in the late 1940s, they took basically all of the metal in here, including the guns, and they sold it for scrap to try to recoup some of the cost of World War II. So almost all the guns you see on site today we got from the Navy. They're the same time period, they're the same caliber, they're just slightly different models. Something else that wouldn't have been here in the 1940s is the big glass front. This gun needs to be able to move in order to aim, so you can't have anything blocking that off. That means as hot or as cold as it was outside, that's as hot or as cold as it was inside. This wasn't necessarily the most glamorous of home front postings. In the winter, you have to deal with the wind and the snow. In the summer, you've got the sand and the bugs. But it was a very important posting. If you wanted to fire this gun, the first people in the room would be the shell team. They'd come in with their artillery shell and a pulley system attached to this railing we see above us. They would bring that shell into place and lower it down into what's known as the shot cart. The shot cart would line the shell up with the barrel, making it really easy for your ramming team to go ahead and ram that shell home where it needs to be. Once that's done, your shell team would get out of the way because hot on their heels comes the powder team with their powder tray. Your powder team would line your tray up with the barrel, and again, that would get rammed home. Once shell and powder are in there, it's time to seal the breech. And we do that by operating what's known as the breech block. This 12-inch gun is so big that just the breech block right here weighs one ton. But you can see it doesn't actually take that much effort for me to get this thing moving. That's me moving 2,000 pounds, and it's not like I'm the world's strongest parks employee. This gear system right here is really well designed, built, maintained. If you watch some of the old 40s training films, you will be amazed at the speed the guys get these things closed. Every time I watch it, I feel like they're just gonna blow their shoulders out. They're cranking so incredibly fast. As this is being sealed, we've got a group of soldiers standing over by the telephones. They're getting calls from the plotting room, letting them know how they have to aim their gun. But imagine how loud it would have been in here in the 1940s. Dozens of men running around, equipment and machinery making noise. You wouldn't have been able to just yell those numbers over. So instead, the guys by the phones wrote those numbers on the chalkboards you see. That way, the men manning the gun could look over, see what number they had to dial into, and go about their business without adding to all the confusion in here. This gun was aimed using a, ser a series of gears. So we had one gentleman standing near the front, he would operate a wheel that would elevate and depress the barrel of your gun. And we actually had three guys underneath the gun operating a hand crank that would move your barrel left and right. So that's how you aim this thing. Once you're loaded and aimed, it's time to fire. Your trigger man would normally fire this gun by pushing down on a big lever. That lever would complete an electric circuit. The circuit would throw a spark onto your powder and set off your gun. So electricity was very important to Battery 519. But let's say for some reason the electricity wasn't working. We could still fire this gun off. In that case, your trigger man would take a big long piece of rope called a lanyard. He would attach it to a little device called a friction primer sitting up here. He would then step out a couple feet, wind that lanyard around himself, and give a good sharp turn. And the force of his turn would engage the friction primer, kind of like flint knocking against steel, manually throwing a spark onto the powder that would then set off your gun. Either way he does it, I feel pretty bad for the trigger man because hearing protection wasn't mandatory or standard until 1953. During World War II, when you fired off this gun, you turned your back to it, you covered your ears, opened your mouth real wide, and you hoped. But your trigger man, whether he's pushing down on that lever or he's turning with that lanyard, he can only block off one ear at a time. So he basically has to choose which ear he wants to hear out of for the rest of his life. Again, not the easiest posting, but a very important one. I think I mentioned that this was a naval gun, and on naval ships, they didn't really have room for the big uh, lever. So instead, they used a slightly simpler electric trigger. And we've kept their trigger as a little bit of an homage, and we've also rigged it up to give you something of a simulation of what it's like when this gun went off. So three, two, one. All of that noise that you just heard was less than 10% of what this gun actually sounded like when it went off. 
So take all of that noise, multiply it by 10, and now you have some idea of the power that these guys were dealing with here. We always like to end with a big bang, so I'm gonna start wrapping things up. I hope you have a better understanding of 12-inch guns and their purpose here at Fort Miles, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.